financial sector is increasingly reaping the rewards of the rush towards digitization, with cloud-based capabilities providing scalability, flexibility, and the ability to mine data faster and to greater depths. Cloud providers have invested enormous resources in security and resilience to protect their customers. But events have shown that even the best are not invulnerable from cyber attacks. Joining us now to look at whether cloud providers are cybersecurity saviors or potentially single points of failure is Andrew McCormack, Chief Information Officer at Payments Canada, and Diana Henderson, Offering Manager, IBM Z and Linux One. Welcome to Cybers TV, to the both of you. Andrew, let's start with you. Tell us about Payments Canada and more specifically how it uses cloud services and of course the benefits because you're a cloud enthusiast. Indeed I am. Uh, <laughs> so Payments Canada is the, uh, is the designated uh, operator of the clearing and settlement systems in Canada, and we set all the rules and uh, legal framework for how payments and money moves in the country. Uh, in terms of cloud, we've been on a cloud journey for about three to four years now, and we started out kind of taking baby steps and building out our kind of our, 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 uh, our, our new IT operating model started to transform the people, the technologies, and the architectures that we would use, and then started moving some of the workloads that were less kind of entrenched in our environment and a little bit easier, sort of a walk before you run strategy, if you will. Um, the benefits for us have been tremendous. Um, our new ideology, this whole new cloud world, has allowed us to embody our technology environment into code. So everything is infrastructure as code and policy as code. And it really helps transform our sysadmins kind of back into engineers, if you will, um, which has led to really you know, tangible bin business benefits, um, much more aggressive patching and vulnerability management. Um, the ability to do live migration, so having a service up and running and migrating it to the next release with zero downtime. Uh, more frequent and higher quality releases of applications. Uh, a reduction in human error and, uh, and much more transparent and auditable processes actually because everything is again code and less prone to uh, creative or uh, human uh, tendencies. So the usage has really exploded effectively, hasn't it? It really has. I mean, uh, I, we set a target of having about 30% of our infrastructure you know, in the cloud uh, by the end of this year, and we're very much on, t on, on, uh, on track to achieve that. Diana, can you tell us about what role the IMB, IBM sorry, Z mainframe is playing in the cloud today? So with, with IBM Z, we're really focused on right now, how can we enable our customers to get to the cloud, get onto their journey to the cloud, whether it's building out an on-premise cloud within their own data centers, joining the public cloud, um, making sure that we're able to play in a multi-cloud, hybrid cloud kind of a world. And we're really focused on a couple of areas, in particular one with the public cloud. What we've built out are a set of services in a fairly new portfolio called the HyperProtect portfolio, um, set of services that are really focused on the, the very much the, the um, uh, I would say the most critical mission critical types of workloads that customers are wanting to, to run. And so with Z in the cloud, right, customers are able to have access to the traditional scale and flexibility and security that the mainframe already brings to bear. Um, so we have, with HyperProtect, we have four services for key and cryptographic management so that we're, we're really protecting the keys with industry-level hardware security. Um, we're also having data as a service with uh, focusing right now on open source databases like Postgres and Mongo. We're going to also have a virtual server capability, which allows you to bring kind of a traditional Linux environment to the platform. And then also containers, so really embracing things like Docker container technology and Kubernetes as well from a management perspective. So that's one key area we're working on right now. Okay, so, so plenty happening, but Andrew, there always has to be a flip side to this because there is the question whether security has become a distraction to organizations. So if that be the case, what other questions should they be asking? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. And you know, I think your organization has to decide, you know, what are your objectives, first of all? Do you intend to just lift and shift your environment into the cloud, or do you want to use this as an opportunity to fundamentally transform your, your technology operating model? Um, for us, we chose the latter and, and really kind of rolled up our sleeves, uh, involved all of our first line, you know, business functions in the, in the decision making and the process, as well as our second line risk and control functions. 
um, you know, your, your security model has to change. And you really also have to understand what um, the shared security model is in the cloud. Uh, security is not a distraction, it's a responsibility, and we have to uh, figure out what the cloud providers uh, take care of and what is still within our responsibility. And that's usually you know, protecting your data um, and, 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 and starting down the sort of IT stack. Of course, the cloud is multifaceted in that there's, you know, in, uh, there's um, infrastructure as a service, which is sort of that base package, and then there's sort of platform as a service. And Diana mentioned things like containerization and Kubernetes, and, and sort of the more you go up and away from the traditional infrastructure and VMs and up into this, this containerization and, and Kubernetes uh, framework, um, you really do benefit from more and more of the cloud provider's capabilities. But that being said, it is still a shared, uh, shared responsibility all the way up. So what types of applications have already moved to the cloud, Diana? So that's really kind of an interesting question because um, a lot of times it's, it's really about what are the customers kind of focused on from a, uh, what's the, the usage and the, the, the purpose of the application. So a lot of the applications started off really on the edge, very much consumer-based applications that were focused on moving to the cloud. Even applications like Box from a, a file management perspective were things that were cloud native on the edge, things you can really access through your uh, personal devices. And so that was really the first stage that we like to call chapter one. And so now we're moving into this kind of chapter, chapter two stage where you really want to think about how do you get those more critical workloads, the mission critical workloads you have in your organization that have been running your core business for, in some cases, decades for some of our customers. So how do we get those into the cloud and now interacting with the cloud? So that's really the focus of our customers and we're trying to help them with that. I mean, both of you have put forward a very convincing case to go onto the cloud, but just picking up on something that you mentioned, Andrew, you talked about containerization and this sense of the shared responsibility. Right. Are these critical questions, for example, that companies need to ask when they're deciding to move to the cloud, or amongst the critical questions they should be asking? They are absolutely uh, the critical questions, and um, you know, again, it's not just the benefits don't really um, become realized if you just do this simple shift, uh, take your legacy applications and move them to the cloud. Um, it's really only when you, you go deep and embrace kind of the, the potential of this that you can realize those operational improvements, the security, the reliability uh, improvements and benefits. And for us, there's also been a kind of a hidden benefit, which is the, 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 the talent kind of aspect of it. You know, we, we took an organization that had a long, long history, uh, uh, a successful history in, in operating the services that we do, um, but this move to the cloud is kind of invigorated and rejuvenated our staff, frankly. It's given them kind of a new raison d'etre, if you will, and uh, it's also allowed us to attract, uh, I would say, new uh, staff who, who've really, um, uh, we've become more and more an employer of choice and more competitive in, in the talent marketplace. So again, I sound very pro-cloud, I guess, because <laughs> I am. Yes, you are. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think the benefits are real, and, and, uh, but it, it does have to start with a clear and coherent cloud strategy and an awareness that it's a multi-year journey. It's a process, it's a deep transformation for your organization, and, um, uh, and it's not easy. You know? So we've talked potential benefits, but what about examples of how Z is impacting the financial services industry in the cloud right now? So, so Z has been around for a number of decades and, and really been foundational to a lot of the core transactional processing workloads that financial services have run for a number of years. But we're also seeing uh, the emergence of fintechs. And so one of the areas that we've been looking at and working with clients on is in this area of, of digital assets and the tokenization of assets. And so this is really a pretty vast area, um, whether you're talking about exchanges that are hosting the types of digital currencies that customers are looking to bring to bear, or you're looking at even um, custodians who are not only managing the actual digital assets themselves, but it's really important how they're managing the keys that are protecting those digital assets. And so we feel we have uh, differentiated infrastructure that can really enable and help this particular market. And, and Andrew, what are the tools that exist for the cloud that aren't otherwise available? Because it, it is a pretty unique thing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the fundamental concept is, is really quite 
simple. It's, it's the notion of application programming interfaces or APIs, right? And so what that does is it, it completely abstracts the, the hardware and base software layer away from, from your IT operations. And now everything is done programmatically through these APIs. And it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it, it, I have to acknowledge that, you know, traditional uh, software vendors do, are, are kind of adding APIs to, to the on-premises and traditional softwares that, that we might otherwise use. But um, the adoption is much, much slower and it's kind of a bolt-on versus in the cloud, everything was designed to be API first. And so it really forces you into this whole other paradigm. I've mentioned infrastructure as code. Um, that allows everything to be checked into a source code repository. It means your processes can now be automated. Um, it, building on that, you get into this notion of policy as a code, so you can create very strict guardrails on top of that uh, infrastructure as code layer that says, you know, um, no users are allowed to assign a public IP address to a, to a server or a VM that gets created. And so you can, you can use kind of uh, technical controls to create very strict guardrails about how your environment is created and managed uh, in, a, in, in an operating sense. So those are the, those are the kind of, I guess, the tools and techniques. Uh, and there's a whole bunch more than that um, sitting on top of that, but people much smarter than I would have to <laughs> pick up that conversation. Let's talk pain points. What are the pain points for institutions that want to utilize or in fact moved to the cloud? I, a couple of areas come to mind. So first of all, compliance and regulation. Right? That, that is certainly a, an area where banks now have to think about, okay, if I am not the one managing my infrastructure now, how do I ensure, maintain things like my business continuity, my, my business integrity, uh, data integrity, data protection, um, when I'm handing off some of these controls, uh, information controls to another party, a third party. So that's one of the areas, certainly, I think, also when you look at skills, as, as Andrew kind of talked about, um, skill development we think is pretty important. We're doing a lot to enable our customers to not only help try to help them uh, go after and hire, retain, uh, train employees, but also looking at succession as well. So that, that is an area that's come up as a, a challenge for some of our clients. We're trying to help them with that. And then I, I think tools, so when you look at uh, developers who are trying to build out these next generation cloud native applications, you know, developers are, are king or, or queen, you know, uh, certainly in the industry. Uh, and, and so it's, it's making sure that your environment has the tool set that they want to use because they're going to be integral to building out those applications that are providing innovation to your business going forward. Staying with you, Diana, IBM recently acquired Red Hat. Uh, so what impact has that had on the business? So Red Hat um, is an organization we've actually had quite a history with for a number of years, with an IBM and even within Z. And what's exciting really about this acquisition is we, we really see it's going to allow us to uh, move forward on our cloud journey and our strategy. So when you talk about looking at the technology and leadership that Red Hat provides to the table with their platform as a service, their platform as a service with OpenShift and their ability to provide this layer for building those next gen cloud applications. And then combining that with our history with systems, and in particular with Z, where uh, much of the core data is resident on our platform because of the capabilities we have around security, resiliency, and reliability. So combining those two together, we think is going to be putting us in a really good position to help our clients on their cloud journey. But Andrew, when you, you look at the cloud and its capabilities, how it can be used, particularly in financial services, you can't get away from the R word. And I'm talking specifically about the regulators. So should the cloud be more regulated? And what would that regulation, or what should that regulation look like? So, you know, regulators like customers, um, I think should expect independent verification um, of the security, the privacy, uh, and the compliance controls that all the cloud providers do offer. And so, you know, independent third-party audits uh, on a regular basis, um, you know, control, you know, uh, verification in the data centers, the infrastructure and the operations of the providers is, is a really key 
assurance mechanism. Um, widely recognized certifications exist today, you know, ISO 27000 series, uh, including cloud specific and privacy specific controls and audits exist. So those are kind of, you know, the, the things that I think everyone, including regulators, should and can rely on. It's an emerging space, you know, in the US with things like FedRAMP and, and you know, government use of the cloud uh, being even more regulated and, and controlled. And I think if that's what's required, sure. I think at the end of the day, they all serve to provide and allow uh, regulators and customers that level of confidence and assurance that that whole supply chain is, mm. is, uh, is intact and that, that, you know, ready for the task of running critical production workloads that fundamentally, in our case, um, you know, offer uh, f financial market infrastructures that have to operate and have to be secure and reliable for our economies to operate. So it's, it's, it's inevitable, it's coming, but, but there's a really strong existing fabric of uh, certifications and sure. regulations. Which can be adapted place. accordingly to, sure. to the cloud format. Absolutely. So how does the cloud allow firms to meet their financial objectives, but at the same time, what are the business risks and, of course, the rewards? Well, that's an easy question to answer, <laughs> isn't it? Um, <laughs> the last bit. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, for, for us, it, it's less um, about financial objectives than it is fundamentally about the technology operating model, um, the security and the resiliency and the scalability of the cloud. Uh, not to say that we hope to not, you know, we do hope to realize lower costs over time, but in this current state, which is very much a hybrid state, we've got our legacy, we've got our cloud, and for you know some protracted duration, we will have both. And so we're investing in, in multiple places, and frankly, there's a cost uplift when you do that, right? Uh, and also, there's, a, there's an investment required to transform the organization. So we do hope that over time, our costs and our financial obje objectives will be realized. Uh, certainly, my CFO has that expectation. Um, but uh, again, our primary driver is really around you know the business outcomes that we've talked, the benefits mm. that we've described, um, and those those are being realised uh, as we speak. Okay. Well, we certainly both hope that you uh, you both enjoy Cybos 2019 for the remainder of the week. Uh, that's Andrew McCormick, Chief Information Officer at Payments Canada, and Diana Henderson, Offering Manager, IBM Z as a Service at IBM. Thank you very much, uh, very much both for joining us on Cybos TV. Pleasure, thank, thank you. you.